Hi everyone, it's Liam here from A Shot of Wildlife and today I'm joined by Graham Wallace and my YouTube channel is the Mr G777 So we have come to Lackford Lakes here in Suffolk It's managed by Suffolk Wildlife Trust and today we are in search of... Well, anything we can find really Anything we can find, let's get going Yeah, let's do it Up until 1987, Lackford Lakes was a gravel and sand quarry once extraction had finished, Bernard Tickner, who created the famous Green King Abbot Ale, brought the land and gifted it to Suffolk Wildlife Trust so they could create a nature reserve. Aside from the wide variety of water birds, there are also some rare and interesting species on the land that surrounds the lakes. On the morning of our visit, we went to Hyde A and B without much luck. But at Hyde C, which is named in honour of Bernard, we struck gold and could see hundreds, if not thousands, of waterfowl. Possibly the most numerous of these birds are lapwing. They were given this name because of their unique appearing flight. This is exacerbated by their dark wings and lighter coloured bodies. Although their wings can appear black from a distance, those on adult birds actually have an iridescent green colour when they catch the sunlight. If you get a close enough view, you might also see that lapwings have a little crest of feathers that comes from the back of their heads. Lapwings were not the only birds we could see in high numbers from Bernard's Hyde. These are common teal. The teal is pretty much the smallest duck we see in the UK being only about 60% of a mallard's length and about a third of its weight. Around 2,000 breed in the UK, but about 10 times as many overwinter here, mostly coming from the Baltic and Siberia. For most of the year, the drakes can be distinguished from the females by their chestnut and green heads, but the beautiful bright green wing patch or speculum showing well on one of these drakes is common to both sexes. One bird that has evolved not to stand out, but rather to blend in with its surroundings, is the camouflage snipe. They use their long thin beaks to probe through the soft mud and sediment, searching for food. Their diet is mainly made up of worms, but does sometimes include other burrowing invertebrates. There are around 80,000 pairs of snipe that breed in the UK, and these numbers are boosted by up to a million migrants from the European mainland that travel to spend the winter here. The birds weren't all far away from the hide, and Graham soon spotted something much closer in. While scanning the water for interesting wildfowl, a flash of pinky red had drawn my attention to the bushes on our left. A male bullfinch was flitting about, giving us just teasing glimpses at first, before coming more into view. It's a medium to large finch, with a stocky, necklace profile, and quite a stubby beak. They mainly feed on buds and seeds. The female plumage is the same as the male, except that the underparts are much duller, more of a pinky grey. Adults and juveniles have an obvious white rump which shows well in flight. Time was getting on, so we decided to make a move and head round to the double decker hide. We're in the fourth hide of the day, and this is called double decker hide. Yep, we're in the lower level. And what have we just seen, Liam? We have just seen a kingfisher. Yeah, and we've got some footage too, even better. In spite of how excited we were, it turns out that we hadn't actually managed to get any clear footage of the kingfisher. It flew from one tree to another, and then just as I got it into focus, it was off around the corner and out of sight. I tried to drown my sorrows with a lukewarm cup of coffee and hoped this wasn't our only kingfisher sighting of the day. At this point I got speaking with a lovely lady called Margaret and she told us of a fallen tree just around the corner where she often got great sightings of a nuthatch and other small birds. We decided to go with her and as we got to the stump we discovered her secret. She had a bag of grated cheese in her pocket and sprinkled some on the stump. It didn't take long before the birds appeared. These are great tits. 
They are a common garden species and in autumn and winter they move about in mixed flocks with other tits such as the similar looking blue tit. When they are together you can see how much smaller the blue tit is. We did get a brief glimpse of a nut hatch but it only stayed for a couple of seconds. Behind us at the stump were some logs where we'd been told we might get a nice furry surprise and we did, a bank vole, but only very briefly. It's great to see that Margaret still gets out and still gets to enjoy the wildlife that she clearly loves. The next hide we visited was Bess's hide, but there wasn't any wildlife close in so we decided to move to Fuller's Mill, and just in time, because it started to rain. We're in Bess's hide at the moment, and as you can probably hear, it's chucking it down outside. So Graham's going to have a look at the map, and when it stops, we're going to run for cover. Whilst the rain may have put a dampener on our movements, the same was certainly not true for this moorhen, which pushed on regardless across the water. Just when the rain had eased off, this pair of mute swans glided across, and the male, or cob, having done a bit of bathing, graced us with a lovely wing flap. With the skies clearing, we decided to make a slightly hurried walk to the reception hide, but were intercepted by some fantastic fungi. So, uh, thanks to the little sign they've put out just down the path here, we found some bird's nest fungus. It's clear why these are called bird's nest fungi, but the reason for their shape is amazing. They have evolved so that when a droplet of rain falls inside the cup, it catapults the eggs outwards. In some species, these eggs have stringy tails that tangle around any obstacles they fly past, and where the egg lands, if suitable, is where the fungus will grow the following year. With our route having brought us round to the visitor centre, we decided it would be rude not to pop in for a coffee. It also gave us a chance to see what was visiting their feeding station. Here we see a quick glimpse of a marsh tit, plus some blue tits, and a great tit. A few moments later we got a better view of the marsh tit. It closely resembles the rarer willow tit, but can be distinguished from the more common coal tit by the lack of a white patch on the back of the neck. After finishing our coffees, we headed back round to the double decker hide, hoping to catch another glimpse of the kingfisher. When we got back to the hide, we got some great views of this little bream. It was looking under the surface of the water, trying to find some food. After a few looks, it must have seen something edible, so dived beneath the surface to chase down its prey. Their diet includes aquatic invertebrates, small fish and amphibians. These birds only grow to a length of around 30 centimetres, so they are usually pretty hard to spot. This one made several dives in front of us, but we didn't manage to film it catching any prey. Little grebes are not the only little anglers in the shallows, there was also a couple of newcomers. Little egrets. Until the mid 1990s, the little egret was quite a rare sight in the UK, but over the past couple of decades, due to a northward expansion of its range from France and the Low Countries, it's become a commonly seen species in the southern counties and East Anglia. These two look like they may not be the best of pals. This became even more obvious when they properly fronted up to each other and got into a fight. With the egrets fighting in the background, the real creme de la creme of the fishing bird world decided to make an appearance. This is a female kingfisher, and not only is this the best footage I've ever got of one, it's also the best sighting I've ever had. 
Kingfishers hunt by diving from a perch above the water and surprise their prey. As these birds are only around 15 centimeters from beak to tail, their prey is equally tiny and is usually small fish, tadpoles and aquatic insects. She stayed for a while, going from perch to perch, and we did see her dive a few times but this was always out of shot and she always swallowed her catch before we could get the camera back onto her. After what seemed like 30 seconds of holding our breath and filming as much as possible, she was gone. With a kingfisher in the bag, it was almost time for us to head home, but I couldn't resist getting a bit of footage of this heron. This one may not have an interesting a backstory as Alan from my Great Yarmouth video, but it would probably beat him in a dance-off. In seriousness, I don't know why the heron was dancing about, spearing the mud with its beak. It's not something I've seen before. Maybe it was just having a mad five minutes. We've all been there. Right, so here we are then. It's just gone four o'clock. Uh, we've been here all day. We've had a right mix of weather. It started off really great and then turned really wet and blustery. And we, we did get rather moist, didn't we? <laughs> At one point. Yes, we did. But we've seen some great stuff, all sorts of things, uh, which obviously you've enjoyed in the video. And, um, yeah, it's been great. Okay, so if you do want to see any more British wildlife videos, check out Graham's channel. I'll leave a link for that down below. And be sure to check out some of my other videos as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.